Two years ago, my significant other and I found the perfect place to rent. It was a small tract of fabricated homes. The neighborhood was nice. It was quiet, which for two college seniors wanting out of the noisy dorms was heaven. Now because this was Arizona, it was pre-fab houses. Most of the folks that lived in our neighborhood were 60 or older, save a few. To our left, Sandra and David, an awesome couple in their early 60s, both retired postal workers. They spend summers in Maine and winters here. To our right, Carol, a 40-something who supposedly owned her home business. She looked like she perpetually was sucking a lemon and she was just off. At first, she would occasionally join my significant other for a smoke on the porch, or if we barbecued with Dave or Sandy, we would invite her over. To say she was awkward was putting it lightly. We suspected maybe she was on the spectrum. We would be eating and she would describe how her mother died a slow agonizing death when a tumor in her throat burst, or there was the time where she described in great detail her latest yeast infection. I kid you not. Sometimes I would work out on our porch. I had a small bench with a bar and some weights. One day I am lifting when I almost dropped the bar on my neck. Leaning over me was Carol. I could have snapped your neck like a twig, she mumbled. I sat up. Pardon? I asked. I said you could have really hurt yourself, she said. I doubted what I had heard, chalking it up to not hearing her correctly, but she had this smirk on her face. After that, I tried my best to ignore her. However, I had not told my significant other my suspicions that maybe old Carol was a bit insane. I come home from class one evening and my significant other and Carol are on the porch. I went inside because I was coming down with something and just wanted to go to bed. My significant other comes in and tells me she is going to her job. She worked nights as a dispatcher for the campus police. I am out of it, so she kisses me goodnight, says she will lock up the house and will see me in the morning. Around 1am I wake up covered in sweat. I go to get a glass of water and drink it down. I see my significant other, who I assume is my significant other, on the couch. I am so out of it that I crawl back into bed and fall asleep. The next morning I wake up and my significant other comes in the door, telling me that work was crazy. Wait, you weren't at work, you were here. She looks at me funny. I get a sick feeling in my gut. Fever or no fever, I know I saw someone on the couch. My significant other writes it off as a fever dream. The house was locked up. I forget about it. Life goes on. Graduation is approaching. Things with my side of the family, well, specifically my egg donor, go badly. Long story. Significant other is offered a job back in her home state of New York, in the city. So we give notice to our landlord... We let Sandy and Dave know and one night we tell Carol. She blinks at us and gets up and heads over to her house not saying a word. We just brush it off as weird old Carol. That night we are asleep when I hear creaking coming from the living area. I sit up. Now significant other hears it. She grabs my arm and I grab the metal bat under my bed. Who's there? I ask. Whack the door thuds. Thank God it's locked. My significant other dials 911. Meanwhile, I am watching as someone is recreating the door scene from The Shining. Except whoever was doing it was using a small hatchet. They still were making progress in the door as it was pretty much hollow. The six minutes it took for the police to get there felt like a lifetime. I can now see the hatchet tip in the door. Suddenly we hear the cops tell someone to put their weapon down. I had no idea who it was until we were led out of our place. On the couch in cuffs is Carol. We learned after that she had been in and out of jail. Supposedly she went wacko for cocoa puffs from long-term use of meth. She was arrested and charged with breaking and entering and destruction of property. They tried to get her on attempted assault but she made a plea deal that included some kind of psychiatric treatment. I never could prove that she was in my place that day I was sick, but I'm sure it was her. As we were moving, I was messing around with our storage space, really a crawl space under the home. We never used it. Curious, I crawled around underneath the house and saw if you kicked hard enough, 
you could get through the screen that led to the outside easily. Who knows how many times she might have been in our place or under the house listening to us. We still keep in touch with Sandy and Dave. The unit Carol rented was sold. They haven't seen her since she was carted off to jail. Thankfully, we are thousands of miles away and have never seen her again. This happened about two years ago. For context, I was living in college apartments for students, but unofficially and my unit was on the first floor. It was a three bed, but I only had one roommate at the time who was away for the weekend. I'm a small person, 5'3 and 120 pounds, and my dog is about 25 pounds and not fully equipped for self-defense. It was around 10 p.m. on a Saturday night and I was taking a bath. I heard my dog growl as her haunches went up and I thought it was weird because she hardly does that. I thought, whatever, it's an apartment, somebody's probably partying. So I go out, got dressed and laid in bed with my book. I heard a knock at my door. Hello? I saw your light on. I'm just wondering if I could use your phone. I was working on the lines around here and my truck battery died. I need to call into work and my phone died. So, I ignore because I'm fully aware it could be dangerous. I don't respond, but looking out the peephole I see an older man around mid-60 wearing a blue jumpsuit and a white toolbox. He has gray hair and a gray mustache and I'm wondering why he's working on lines, one, on a Saturday, and two, around 10 p.m. It struck me as odd, so I didn't respond. About three minutes later, he knocks again, saying something like, If I could just use your phone, I could get out of your hair. Sorry. I just need to call my boss and tell him. So I check the peephole again and notice there's no name tag or company on his jumper. I'm silent. My dog growls again, this time more angrily around the front door. She starts pacing and getting frustrated. I texted a friend or two this was happening. Again, this time after about seven minutes, he knocks more abruptly. If you don't want me to keep knocking, let me use your phone so I can get a ride. I know you're home, I see your light. He was beginning to sound frustrated and angry at being ignored. I continued to ignore him and my dog began to show her teeth. She directly faced the door, teeth bearing and began barking viciously. I've never seen her do that before or since. He pounded the door again and didn't say anything this time. I looked back out the peephole, becoming scared for my safety and my mind thought, why does he have his toolbox if he could have left it in his car and why does his company uniform not say the company's name? Why hasn't he moved to another unit? I continued to ignore him, but at this point, more out of shock. He pounded the door once more and my dog barked louder and more aggressively. He said, Fine, I'll have to walk down the street and ask for a phone there. Thanks for nothing. She barked for another minute or so and eventually he left. I was concerned about him entering my side doors, so I locked them and just hoped he didn't as I called some friends. Maybe this man genuinely needed help. Maybe he was working overtime. But it still bothers me today. Why did he focus in on my unit for so long? He spent maybe 15 to 20 minutes trying to use my phone. It's possible his work uniform just wasn't labeled, but why bring the toolbox with you to ask for help? I didn't see what he had in the toolbox, but I would think it'd be heavy and he'd leave it in his truck. He said, I know you're home. Maybe this one is small, but in a three-bedroom unit, why would you specifically address you? Why not say somebody? The most terrifying thing is later that week, around Tuesday or Wednesday, I told my facilities manager there was a man on Saturday from the electrical company trying to get help for his truck battery. She said, Um, our maintenance men do any work on electrical lines. We don't hire contractors. They finished their electrical work near your unit last month, so there'd be no reason to work there. I don't know why he lingered on my unit so long. I felt like prey, likely because 
I was. I had seen a white truck in the lot outside my building for a couple of days before and just assumed it was somebody's friend or something. Lots of people go in and out, but I really think this guy was there watching and waiting for a good moment. About 10 years ago, I was in college and decided at the urging of some of my friends to do an open invite D&D session at my apartment. It was really close to the college itself, but not on campus, and it wasn't part of the dorms in any way. It was above a restaurant and everything, so it was pretty clear that my apartment had nothing to do with student housing. This is important for later. So the night comes and the stage is set. All in all, everyone seems nice and things are going well enough, except for one guy. There always has to be that one guy, so I try to let it slide. He's being really pushy and going on and on about his character's background, and this and that when we have not even got to him yet, and are just trying to set up the story and play the game. Then, because he has some grudge against another guy there, he starts passing me notes and trying to get me to randomly help him kill this guy's character for no reason. First of all, that would have made no sense in the setting of the game, Secondly, that would accomplish literally nothing for those who don't play D&D. It's not like if your character dies in a random one-off game you have to trash it and never bring it out again. Thirdly, this guy was just all up in my personal space, whispering in my ear and passing me notes and telling me how to play, like he was in control of the game or me in any way. It was really uncomfortable and weird. I didn't want to make a scene since I didn't know how everyone who showed up knew one another and decided to just ignore him and try to have a good time, despite the fact that he would not get out of my personal space. When it became clear that I was not going to listen to him and help kill that other guy, he had a complete meltdown. He literally stood up and started throwing D&D books at my head all of them he could reach and screeching that I should have done what he told me to do and this was my punishment and next time I better listen. What? Oh no, 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 not in my house. I opened the door and screamed at him to get out. He told me I couldn't kick him out, so and so had invited him. I told him I didn't care who invited him, that it was my apartment that I paid rent for and I had every right to kick him out and he was lucky I wasn't calling the freaking cops. The rest of the table backed me up and pretty much ended up having to shove him out the door and down the stairs to get him to leave. The dude could not grasp the fact that no means no and his actions had consequences. I'm 100% sure no one had ever made him follow through on any sort of punishment before by the baffled look on his face as I closed the door and locked the door behind him and went back upstairs. So I get back upstairs and people start apologizing to me and telling me he is like that all the time and they didn't actually invite him. He just shows up wherever they go and they can't get him to leave them alone and every time they try he throws a tantrum. We get back to the game and things are going pretty well for about 20 minutes until I hear my doorbell ring. So I go downstairs and it's tantrum guy with some other dude I've never met before. Tantrum guy is standing behind this new guy with his chest puffed out and this whole look about him like, you're in trouble now. So I open the door and ask if they are here to apologize for tantrum guy assaulting me earlier, and new guy immediately turns around to look at tantrum guy, and it's clear he did not get the whole story. I tell new guy what actually happened and he tells me that he is an RA with a school and I have to let tantrum guy back into my apartment if I am holding a school function. I tell RA that... First of all, I rent this apartment, and it is not part of student housing, as should be apparent from the fact that it is, again, above a restaurant. Secondly, even if he was an RA, which I have no proof as he could just be one of Tantrum Guy's friends, that does not give him authority over any building I'm living in because he is not my RA. But that doesn't matter because, again, I don't live in student housing. I live in an apartment above a restaurant. Finally, this is not a school event, it is a private gathering which he would know if he was a real RA and not some guy tantrum guy snagged to come back here to try and do I don't even know what at this point. This RA guy keeps insisting that I have to let him in my apartment and that if I am a student then whatever I live in is student housing and that he needs to come in and inspect the place. 
and this, that, and the other every time I make a point. It becomes more and more clear that this is just some random guy, and they want into my apartment for probably nefarious purposes, thinking that I'm here alone for some reason. I tell them they are not getting in, and if they continue to stand there and try to get me to let them in, or if they try my door after I leave, I'm going to call the cops and proceed to shut the door and head back upstairs. Everyone at the party asks who that was, and when I tell them, they all decide it's time to head home. I tell them they really don't have to, but they tell me it's getting late and this whole thing is starting to weird them out and escalate in weird ways, and I can't really blame them for that. When I go downstairs and open the door for them, Tantrum Guy and the would-be RA are across the street and seemed amazed for some reason that these people were still in my apartment and were now leaving. I never had any more trouble with either of them, but I also never had another D&D night. It just didn't seem worth it. I still play, but just with groups, I know. This happened a couple of years ago. I don't like talking about it that much. It just never seemed like a big deal to me as a kid, but the older I got, the more I think about it and the more it haunts me. It was New Year's Eve 2011 and me and a couple of my friends were having a sleepover. My friend's neighborhood was relatively new so there was still houses being built around him. We had all stayed up until midnight but were still hyper on sugar and had no intention of sleep. One of my friends had the idea of going to play hide and seek in one of the houses being built. We asked his mom and she was okay with it but she gave us her phone and told us to text my friend's dad in case anything happened. We took the phone, got our coats on, and headed outside. The house was only about a hundred yards away from the front porch, so it wasn't that far of a walk. We jogged across the street since it was relatively windy out and we didn't want to stay in the cold air. We decided to play in pairs, but if you were hiding, you had to stay with your teammate. I volunteered to be a seeker. So the two hiders headed into the house while... Me and the other seeker began to count. Once I hit 60, the game began. The house was dark and cold and the only source of light was the bright moon shining through every window and door. We were standing in the empty shell of someone's home. No inner walls had been put up yet and there was no carpeting on the floors. The only thing on the inside was dozens of thick wooden beams. I told my friend I'd take the first floor if he wanted the second and he agreed. He walked past me and up the steps. I was now alone. Something about being in there boosted my confidence, like I was an adventurer or something like that. I walked around the first floor with a smile on my face, braver than ever. I called out the names of my friends, trying to hold in my laughter. Since the house was so dark, you could only see about five feet in front of you, so I made sure to check every nook and cranny. And that's when I found the basement. It was dark and eerie, a hole in the floor really. It looked like it could swallow anything that walked into it. It couldn't have gone down there, I thought to myself. There's no way. But I had checked the entire first floor and heard nothing from my friends upstairs, so I sucked it up and began down the steps. I walked down slowly, taking careful steps because it was nearly impossible to see anything. My footsteps echoed throughout the dark room and I was only able to see to the tips of my fingertips. I walked slowly listening for any types of noises in the darkness. Then I heard something, the slow moving of feet. Hello? I said, following with my friend's names. No response. For a quick second I contemplated turning back around, but I knew if this was them, they wouldn't say anything back. I called out their names again. No response. A smile came across my face. I had found them. Come on out. I said as I walked towards the source of the noise. I heard you guys move. I began to see the silhouette of something in the corner of the basement. It was a person, but only one. Didn't we say the hiders had to stay together? I said to the person. They didn't move, just stayed crouched down in the corner facing the wall. I began to walk closer, fully convinced it was one of my friends. Hey, I found you, you're out. I said. At that moment, I just wanted to get out of the basement. I continued to walk closer. I still wasn't close enough to make out any body features. 
Whoever it was was breathing rather loudly, loud enough for me to hear it from a couple of feet away. Me being the naive kid I was, still thinking it was one of my friends just trying to scare me, smiled. I didn't know what else to do, but I wouldn't take a step closer. That's when the breathing was overpowered by laughter and loud footsteps from upstairs. I found you! I heard through the ceiling. I quickly turned around and ran back upstairs to see who was found, hoping whoever was in the basement with me would follow. I waited on the first floor as I heard them coming down the steps. Got them both, my friend said as he came into my view. I stood there, a confused look on my face. How did you find both of them, I thought to myself. But to my surprise, here came both of the hiders walking from upstairs. My heart dropped. I felt the blood rush out of my face and my legs go weak. I slowly turned around and stumbled towards the front door, without saying a word. Where are you going? They asked. I couldn't open my mouth to speak. There was only one thought in my head at this time. Who was in the basement with me? I made it to the front door, slowly turned the knob, slipped outside, and began running back up to my friend's house. I wanted to get as far away from that house as possible. I began to feel tears welling up in my eyes. I made it to the front porch and collapsed, barely being able to catch my breath because I was so hysterical. I lay there for what felt like ages when I heard my friends come up behind me. I don't even remember what they were saying. All I could think about was the person in the basement. After I calmed down, I told them what happened, and they all seemed as freaked out as me. The fact that I had talked directly to the person for so long is what scared me so much. We decided not to tell his parents since we figured they wouldn't believe us. I didn't sleep for about a week after that, and I still have nightmares about it sometimes. A few months after that night, the house was finished and a family moved in, and I have never heard any complaints about a squatter or anything. The older I get, the more I've come to realize it was probably a crackhead or something like that, and sometimes I feel guilty because I know we probably could have helped them, but it still is terrifying to me. For reference, I'm 22 and female, but I'm also very small and have always been small my entire life. So when I was around 7 or 8, and my brother, who was a year younger than me, was between 6 or 7, my sister came to visit. My sister is actually 15 years older than me, and she wanted to spend the day with my brother and I, so she took us up to a bigger city about 45 minutes away that had much more to do. We ended up going to the river, and the place we went to was interesting. It's a very popular spot, and is in the middle of a town, so it's relatively safe. It's actually in a U shape, so usually when people bring their kids, they're at the tip of the U because that's where the water is safest. So my sister didn't really want to swim, but my brother and I did, so we put on our little swimsuits and ran in. Not too long after we were playing around, a man came over to me. I've never been one to judge, but little me thought he looked dirty and smelled gross. He was basically totally naked except for some ratty underwear which I didn't think was a big deal at the time. The man came over to me and said, Hi pretty girl, how are you? And I had never been taught stranger danger. I lived quite the sheltered life, private school my entire life, overprotective parents that rarely allowed me to leave the house without them. So I thought the man just wanted to be friends. He asked for a hug and whenever anyone asked me for a hug I would give them one. So after hugging me, he grabbed my hand and wouldn't let go. He then says, Is this your brother? And I said yes, and he said something along the lines of, You're both so pretty. He was still holding my hand tightly, and he says, How would you guys like to go on an adventure? And my brother and I were excited because we didn't understand that we would not like this adventure. He said, Okay, you just have to come with me let's make it a surprise for your mom. And I said she's my sister and he said, even better, which I still didn't understand. He started to pull me away from my sister who had looked away because someone she knew had stopped to say hello to her and he told my brother to come along. 
All of a sudden I hear my sister scream my name so loud, everyone within earshot looked over. She started yelling things like, Let go of my sister and I'm calling the cops, you give her back. Things along that nature. Actually, other parents who were around were grabbing their kids as a precaution, but someone seemed like they were ready to help if the guy put up a fight. My sister, who was not in a swimsuit, ran into the river to pull me out of his grip, and she grabbed my brother's hand while carrying me away. She decided that she didn't want to let this creepy dude ruin mine and my brother's fun. She let us go to a different part of the river in the same area that was still very popular and had lots of kids and families. My sister was sitting and watching us, and we were not too far from her when I said, Hey look, it's my friend. And my sister lost it on the dude. He literally tried to say to her, Come on, I'll watch your kids. You go shop for a few hours, and you can have them back when you are done. I'll have fun taking care of them. And she told him he was sick and twisted, and he was going to regret touching me if he ever tried it again. He once again tried to convince her to let him take me, and... He was edging his way over to me and my brother again, so my sister punched him in the face and then kicked him in the leg and told him he would get a lot worse if he dared to do anything else. We told a police officer, but they said it was probably just a homeless man and there was nothing that they could do about it, so my sister got my brother and I ice cream so we felt better about having to leave early. My dad was not happy when the first thing that we told him was that my sister beat up a guy but he was even more furious when he learned what happened. So this is a story that I've debated sharing for a very long time. It's something that happened over several years and I feel like it's something that I need to get off my chest. At the time of the story I was in high school. I had began to grow quite a following on a website called DeviantArt and had made several friends out of my watchers. At one point, I decided to make a group on Google Hangouts where I'd be able to talk with my friends and watchers more often. That's when this one person started talking to me. For the sake of the story, let's call him Jackson. Jackson started off as a kind of awkward guy who would rarely join the calls when we had them. Eventually, he got comfortable enough to do voice calls and quickly bonded with a lot of my online friends. As we grew close, he told us that he had autism... Looking back, that may have let us excuse a lot of red flags and toxic behavior as he was not the only one in the chat who had autism. The problem was Jackson was very aggressive towards my other autistic friends. This would range from him hinting that he thought they were ugly to flat out yelling at them if they said something he didn't agree with. There was even a point when he threatened to hurt my friend's cat if she didn't shut up. This caused her to stay away from the chat for weeks. Whenever we would confront him about it, he would blame it on his autism and talk about how much of a curse it was, which in turn would make us drop the subject. After a while, Jackson began to help some of us with our comics and art projects, and by help I mean he would try and find ways to force his ideas and characters onto us. When we would try to give him criticism or tell him that we didn't think his ideas would fit with our stories, he would lose it. We later found out that he would do this because he didn't like how some of us had a larger following than him, and he thought if he was part of our stories, he would get some of our followings. It eventually became something we grew numb to as artists. Then one day, when Jax and I were in the call alone, he confessed that he had feelings for me and asked if I could be his girlfriend. Being a teenager with low self-esteem, I said yes. The relationship didn't last long as he would constantly do things that I told him made me uncomfortable, like he asked if I would pleasure myself when I thought about him, etc. At first I didn't mind it, but eventually it was all he would ever talk about with me. I would tell him I wasn't comfortable with him asking that and he would continue despite this. We broke up two months into the relationship. He still wouldn't give up though. Whenever we would join the calls now, he would comment about how good looking I was or how because I was chubby that meant I was automatically adorable and would constantly compare me to the other girls in the chat to make them feel terrible. Once again, whenever we would bring this up with him, he would blame it on his curse that was autism. It got worse when he started dating someone who had recently joined the chat. Her name is Lucina. Jackson and Lucina happened to live really close to each other and after a while began to date. I was relieved as I thought this would stop him from constantly making inappropriate comments towards me. It didn't. 
Whenever Lucina wasn't in the call, he would continue to make comments towards me. At that point, I had given up trying to make him stop and simply ignored it. Then one of my stories in particular started to get popular and that's when I met my current boyfriend. Let's call him C. C joined the Hangouts chat when we instantly began to bond. After a few months of talking, C and I started dating, much to the dismay of Jackson. He then began to aim inappropriate comments towards me when C was in the call. Unlike me, C would always call Jackson out on this. Jackson continued to blame his autism for his behavior. The final straw was when Jackson threatened to dox me, find out where I live, and hurt me. All the while, C was in the call. C and I had enough at this point and we told Jackson that what he had just did was not okay, especially when he had a girlfriend. He then told us he didn't love Lucina and that he was only dating her to make me jealous so I would date him again. C lost it at that point and called Jackson every name under the sun before kicking him out of the chat. No less than a couple of hours later, Lucina joins the call in tears. She tells us that Jackson had broken up with her and that he was screaming and yelling how he was going to dox me and C for kicking him from the chat. He would say things like how he was kicked out of school for nearly strangling a kid and that he could do it to one of my friend's pets. Thankfully, he was bluffing and nothing ever came of the threats. After that, he tried to persuade my other friends that we had bullied him and wrongfully kicked him from the chat. Thankfully, my friends knew of his toxic behavior and just blocked him. It's been years since I heard anything about Jackson. One of my friends who lives near him told me that he had been arrested for assault. I don't know if that's true or not, but I honestly wouldn't put it past him. I am very close with my boyfriend's seven-year-old son, and last Saturday I took him out to one of our local parks to go sledding. There is a dedicated sled hill there that tons of families use in the winter, which is actually a wide dam that goes across the park by the lake. I should explain there is also a bike walking path around the entire perimeter of the park that actually goes across the top of the dam and leads to either a main road sidewalk or curves back down to continue the path at the bottom of the other side of the hill. We got there just before 3pm and had a blast all afternoon sledding and venturing out on the frozen lake. It was a fairly busy day at the park but around 5.30 it starts to get dark so the temperature was dropping and people started to go home for dinner. None of these things phased my little man because less people meant free reign of the hill to claim better sledding territory. While we were playing, I noticed a man walking along the path at the top of the hill but didn't think much of it because there was still one other group sledding. I did watch him though because I thought it was a little odd to be taking a walk in the dark alone no dog or anything, when it's pretty cold out and I also felt he probably wasn't a park employee doing a safety round because it wasn't late enough for them to be out and they usually are in warm vehicles. So, a little weird, but he just walked the path with his head down and when I saw him pass totally, I let us continue sledding. When I got to the top of the hill, I looked to the bottom of the other side and saw him walking along the path there. I brushed the weird vibe off to me being too paranoid about serial killers, kidnaps, and the like. I generally did not even notice the other group leave because of how engrossed we were in our little racing competitions. I also didn't have my phone out much because I didn't want the cold to drain the battery faster, but going from when I made the call to my boyfriend, I think I saw the guy again at around 6.30. I was at the bottom yelling taunts up to the kid that he couldn't surpass the distance I had gone when I saw the man walking again, right in my boyfriend's son's direction. The height, coat color, and demeanor of this guy were all the same, but other than that, I can't be 100% sure it was the same person. I looked around and realized how dark it actually was, how far away my car in the parking lot was, and how very much alone we were. The only other people near to us were maybe three people still out in their ice fishing huts about half a mile away on the lake. I yelled hurry up and hurry up as playfully as I could. Kid sledded down and Guy was passing by the same way he did before. At that point, I was very uneasy and told my little buddy it was probably time to go. He insisted I go up one more time to see if I could beat his distance. This kid had been waiting forever for this sledding day and was having so much fun, so 
I quickly got up the hill and got ready to sled down. The guy was to my left now, a good distance away, and looked like he was just going to walk the same path. I started to sled down while keeping my head turned toward him. He was almost to the main sidewalk when, all of a sudden, I watched him turn and head diagonally down the hill towards us, fast. He was making a beeline for right where we were. I was scared, almost paralyzed. I hit the bottom of the hill, stood up, and ran over towards the direction of the parking lot in front of us. Boyfriend's son was half focused on the fact that I didn't let my sled ride out to its full distance and half focused on finding his water bottle before we left, which was somewhere on the ground in the snow. I didn't want to scare him, but I said, Leave it. We need to leave. Leave it. The guy was approaching, head down and one hand in his coat pocket, and we were flat out retreating. It didn't feel dangerous enough to break out into a run, plus my car was at the back of the lot and the ground was quite slick, or to call 911, but I got scared enough that I felt a rush of adrenaline and shoved the kid, still complaining about the bottle, behind me, pulled out my phone and called my boyfriend who I prayed had gotten off of work because I didn't even comprehend the time until later, about 6.45. He answered and I loudly said, Hey bud, dad's on the phone. Yeah, we're just leaving the park. What would you like me to pick up for dinner? I was afraid this guy was going to pull out a gun or a knife and try to make us go somewhere else, and I know a phone call probably wouldn't intimidate someone who really wants to hurt you, but it was what my hyped-up scared self decided to do. I went on to ask my boyfriend what time he got off of work, even though I know when he's got off exactly and other questions that might tip him off to something going on. He just answered them as if I were an idiot and as he talked to me, the guy passed us very closely. He was tall and had a hood on but I could see his face and glasses. There was so much free open space around us and he walked so close to me his coat nearly brushed me and the fog from my breath touched him. He kept his hand in his pocket the whole time. I'm 24 years old, 5'1", and didn't even have my pepper spray on me because my purse was in my car. Thankfully, he just kept going, didn't look back and disappeared behind a truck in the parking lot. Very quietly, I whispered to my boyfriend who was getting annoyed with the random lines of conversation. Will you just stay on the phone with me? He paused for a minute and asked, Are you scared? What's going on? I quickly explained it and pulled my protesting kid along to my car where I shoved the kid in, shoved the sleds in and got out of there. I think there's something in your brain that makes you want to believe a bad situation isn't happening. I kept trying to minimize everything as it was happening probably to keep myself from panicking. Now I just keep thinking about how creepy it was that he came back after everyone had left and seemingly made a decision to turn back around and rush down a hill towards a woman and a child who were all alone in the dark park. If he didn't have bad intentions at all. I'm sure he could tell I was scared by the way I reacted to everything he did. He was either a creep or really lacked awareness in what he was doing. From now on, we go home when we see the last few people go home, and it starts to get dark. This happened in the summer of 2013 when I was 27 and living in a rather large city in Texas. I lived in a historic district that had gorgeous old mansions from the late 1800s and early 1900s on one block and crack houses on another. The area was and still is in a perpetual state of transition and I lived on the cusp of the two sections. I had moved to this area in January from an even shadier part of downtown to an old house that was split into four units. Each of us had one-fourth of the house, so two upstairs and two downstairs, with the common foyer area where the mailboxes were. I lived in the bottom right unit, if you're looking at the house from the street. Despite the shadiness of the area and the crackheads that wandered around at night, I mostly felt safe. I liked the house and liked the other tenants, all female like me and all around my age. The girl who lived in the unit across the hall from me, Gigi, was a little quirky but she was nice and had a gorgeous cane corso named Carlo. One day in early August, I ran into Karen who lived in a unit upstairs. 
She told me she was moving out later that month to live with her boyfriend. I was a little bummed because she was nice and quiet but otherwise didn't give it much thought. She moved out during the day on Thursday, August 22nd while the rest of us were at work. I had plans to go to my then boyfriend's house that evening so I got home from work that evening and grabbed my dog, Leopold, German Shepherd that I had just gotten in July and walked out the front door. I was locking up and was startled when a guy, about my age, came up the walkway and spoke up from right behind me. Hey. I jumped and turned, feeling mostly okay because I had Leopold even though he's a huge baby. He looked scary so I said hello back. Here's what followed. You guys live here? Uh, yes. I do. Why? Stupid to admit, I know, but I had just walked out, locked up, and had my dog with me, so I didn't feel like I could reasonably deny it. Are you moving? No. I believe one of the other tenants moved out recently, but we don't interact a lot, so I'm not 100% sure. Well, her movers assaulted me today, and I wanted to press charges. I'm really sorry to hear that. Did you notice the name on the van of the moving company? If so, you could contact the company and let them know what happened. Note, he looked just fine, so I didn't really know what he meant by assaulted. Yeah, thanks, bye. I thought nothing of the encounter. He seemed normal-ish, so I went on my way, spent a few hours at my boyfriend's house, and headed home. I pulled up to my house around 9.15pm to see three cop cars with their lights on and flashing and a lot of commotion in the front. I walk up to see that the glass in the front door had been busted. As I walked up, Gigi stopped me and she was pretty hysterical. She said she was in her place when she heard a loud noise that was the glass shattering. She opened her door to look. Remember, we have the bottom units in the foyer so our front doors were right at the front of the house. To see a guy running away, the glass broken and a note on the glass. The note said, Watch your back. Gigi then told me that Karen told her that she was moving out. Her movers got into a kerfuffle with some guy because he kept trying to aggressively sell them drugs and would not leave them alone even when they asked him to. One of the movers pushed him and chaos broke out. When Karen and her boyfriend got into their car to drive away, the guy got into his car and followed them on the freeway, honking and trying to make them crash. They eventually lost him. I knew immediately who they were talking about and told the police and Gigi about my earlier encounter. The police wrapped things up shortly after and our landlord, who came when Gigi called, promised to fix it the next day. They couldn't find the culprit and I didn't know where he lived, only that it had to be close by because of how he left on foot after speaking with me. I went to bed thinking things would be okay, but I was so wrong. I went about business as usual the next day and went out with my boyfriend for a while. We returned around 11pm and parked his car out front next to mine. There was gated parking in the back, but that night I didn't park back there. The windows and blinds were open and we were playing records and drinking scotch. All was well. Until I noticed movement outside. It was the guy. I watched as the guy started circling my car erratically, almost like he was possessed and dancing around the vehicle like he was getting ready for some ritual. I alerted my boyfriend and he came to look out with me. All of a sudden this guy goes into a frenzy and starts beating my car with a tire iron. I freak out. My boyfriend runs out to tell him to stop and I call 911. I'm on the phone with the operator telling her what's happening. At this point my boyfriend was yelling at the guy to stop and the guy told my boyfriend that he had a gun and would hurt him as he continued to smash my car and then moved on to my boyfriend's. The operator heard him threaten us and told us to get inside and not engage and that's what we did. I stayed on the phone with her for a very long time and watched as he yelled incoherently at me. It was directed at me but I had no idea what he was saying. He kept yelling terrible things about me and to watch my back and attacked my vehicle in a violent frenzy. It took the cops two and a half hours to show up. I was livid at the lack of response given the act of threat and damage to property. He was nowhere to be found when they got there but on the plus side. I figured out where he lived. He lived in an apartment complex across the street. When the police arrived, they assessed the damage to my car and it turns out he had also decided to key my car all over. 
I didn't notice it when we got home because the street was rather dark and it was late. I hadn't paid attention. On the driver's side door, it looked like he had tried to spell out some terrible words. Unfortunately, the police couldn't find him and were absolutely useless. I barely slept that night and was incredibly upset, but the story doesn't end there. On Sunday, Gigi called me again. The guy was loitering around the house and staring at it from the sidewalk. She got spooked and called the cops again. Nothing happened. They still couldn't find him and honestly, I can't remember why he was so hard to find for them. I only remember being angry at them and him. A few nights later, Gigi heard sounds outside again and called the cops. Again. This time he had left a brick and another note that read, Watch your back but he had laid it outside my window. At this point, the same cops had showed up a few times and Gigi is in the foyer telling him that she had heard weird sounds and muffled talking. One of the cops looked at me quizzically and said, Miss, did you know this gentleman before? No, I had never met him until he approached me on Thursday to ask about Karen moving out. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Are you positive you didn't have any sort of relationship with him previously? Yes, I am. Why are you asking? I was getting really annoyed at this point. Well, I think it's a little weird that this guy seems to be focused on you. I'm wondering if, given the word he had carved into your car, and what he was shouting a few nights ago, if you didn't have a previous relationship with him that ended poorly, and now he's taking it out on you. I was really angry at this insinuation. It was as though I was someone to blame for this. It was as if for him to do what he did, it had to be because I'd done something. It couldn't just be because, you know, he's a psycho. I can't remember exactly what I said to the officer because I was so upset and Gigi, bless her heart, was extremely offended on my behalf. However, in between Gigi's feminist rant, my growing anger and frustration and my dogs whining and pawing for attention, the officer said something I didn't process until a little later. He said it was obvious I was the target of a lot of actions, not Gigi. There was only me and her there at the time, so the upstairs was empty, and that if, if it's true I didn't know him previously, that he thought it was likely that he approached the movers and me intentionally, and he thought it was likely he had been watching me for a while. I went back to my place shortly after and stewed in my anger while drinking copious amounts of box wine. A few nights later... We are now at the beginning of October now. I woke up in the middle of the night around 2.30am incredibly thirsty. My room was at the back of my unit and house so I walked from the back bedroom to the kitchen which was in the middle of the unit. I'm not sure why but for some reason I had the urge to peep through the crack in my blinds in the living room. At the front facing street and there he was. My house was pitch black so he couldn't see me but there he was standing on the sidewalk in front of my unit just staring at my windows. I jumped back and started hyperventilating, made sure the doors were locked and contemplated calling the police but axed that idea because I was so angry at them. I stayed standing and watching from the cracks in the blinds. He barely moved for almost an hour and when he walked away, it was obvious from the way he moved he was either intoxicated or on something. I made sure the doors were locked and ran back to my bed and checked on Leopold, who was snoozing peacefully on his bed in my room. I couldn't fall back asleep. I was anxious all of the next day. I was also scared that Leopold was home alone and was scared that maybe the guy would break in my window this time and get in my unit and somehow hurt my dog. I was just a nervous wreck. The next night I couldn't sleep. Around 3am I made my way to the front and there he was again. That night played out like the night before. This sick dance went on for weeks until he started leaving the sidewalk and walking into the yard and getting closer to the house and my window. I watched every night as he got closer and I was terrified. Eventually one of my friends gave me his gun and another one gave me a shotgun. And yes, I knew how to use both. I have my concealed carry license but didn't have my own gun at the time. They didn't really make me feel any better. Those weeks were some of the longest of my life and every night was the same. I didn't sleep, work was hard because I wasn't sleeping and I was worried about my dog. I was just a ball of panic and fear for most of October. I watched him watch my windows and get closer and closer until one night he was right outside my window. 
right outside. I was frozen on the other side, scared if I moved too much or looked through the crack he'd see me. Somehow I worked up the courage to peek a little and my blood froze. He was peeing on the house right under my window. About a year prior, I had seen a movie with Sally Field called An Eye for an Eye, where she obsessively stalks her daughter's killer who got off on a technicality. She follows him while he's working delivering groceries. After he delivers groceries to this woman's house one day, she watches as he urinates on the woman's fence before he leaves. He returns shortly thereafter to do terrible things to the woman, so needless to say, I was freaked out. I called the landlord in the morning and let them know I needed to move and relayed some of the information and asked him that he let me out of the lease. He agreed. He knew he could easily find another tenant so he wasn't worried about letting me go. A little while later I was driving around with Leopold just to cruise and listen to music and mull over my living situation. I was still on my street but further up in the nice part with the old mansions. I love this part of the street and it's a relatively well known street in my city. I was admiring the house when I saw a sign that said that there was a back house for lease. I had loved this house since I was a little girl and it was a huge corner lot with a massive gate circling the backyard where the back house was located. I called immediately. I spoke to the owner who said he could show it to me that afternoon. So I called my mom to come look at it with me and I loved it. He didn't mind that I had a dog and said the dog could have the run of the yard as long as I cleaned up after him. He asked why I was moving and I explained the situation to him. He told me that he was a retired police chief of a relatively big city nearby and assured me that no one was getting through his fence and security system and that he'd look after me. I moved later that week and ended up spending almost four years in that back house. I'm afraid the end is very anticlimactic. The story is not as scary as others on here but I was terrified for the duration of this time. I never saw the guy again despite being in closest proximity and I never want to again. I really suppose it just all came down to the fact that he was just some druggie and his mind was so fixated on one thing. After reading multiple stories on here, I became extremely grateful I had never had any creepy experience. However, today something truly creepy happened and I thank this thread for making me more diligent. Today, after my four-year-old's basketball game, I picked up his younger sister, not my child, that's another story, so they could spend some time together. She is two. We planned to go to Chuck E. Cheese with my friend and her son, but we had about an hour to kill. I decided to take them to the mall. My son needs new shoes. I had a return to make and the mall has some little quarter rides to entertain them. I understand the story, it's kind of important to know the layout of the mall. The mall is basically a cross shape. The four exits are at the ends of the lines in the cross. In the middle of the cross there are food stands and random booths, like selling phone cases for example. It is also really important to understand that when you are walking with a two year old and a four year old you are walking slow, like really slow, like a walk that should take one minute turns into five. So we park and enter the mall. We go into the shoe store first and get my son some shoes. After that we head back towards Victoria's Secret to make my return. Victoria's Secret is a different line in the cross shape so we have to pass through the middle area and then turn left. As we are walking, I notice a guy in front of us keeps staring back and looking at us, like a lot. He's pretty far ahead of us but also slowing down to shorten the distance between us. Of course he turns in the direction we have to go but I try to slow down. Finally we get to the Victoria's Secret and he is still a ways ahead of us but just staring at us as he walks over his shoulder. At this point I was angry and decided it's better to call him out on his stuff, maybe he'll stop. As we are walking in and he is staring I make direct eye contact with him and say, Hello? Not in a friendly way but more like, can I help you, I see you staring, I'm not dumb, cut the crap. He just looks away and keeps walking. I thought that was the end of it. Anyway, we spend a good 25 to 30 minutes in Victoria's Secret. I'm no longer thinking of the guy. After that, it's time to leave, so we walk back out the way we had come in. 
meaning once again we have to walk through the middle and then now turn right and walk down to the exit. As soon as we walk out the Victoria's Secret, the guy is standing maybe 20 feet in front of us, literally standing behind a pole and staring at us, like he was waiting for us to leave. As soon as he sees us, he begins walking to the middle. So once again, he is in front of us. He lingers in the middle area and we turn right. He then turns right and walks past us and into the shoe store we had already gone into. When we reach the shoe store, he is staring at us from within, like he is waiting for us to pass. Then, he walks out and walks away from us, back to the middle, but is still staring. When he gets to the middle, he turns around like a U-turn and is now walking behind us. Slowly, like really slowly because we are already walking slow. At this point, I've had enough. I immediately duck into a store and tell the guy working to call security I need an escort to my car. I am not sure if he saw us go into the store because about 10 seconds later, I see him walking by the store looking around. I assume he then walked outside since it was by the exit. Luckily, everything was fine. I'm not sure what would have happened or if anything would have happened at all, but better safe than sorry. This was not a normal coincidence. This was straight up being stared down and stalked while in the mall. I don't know if this was about me or about the children or maybe he wouldn't have done anything at all. But either way, not taking the risk. But something interesting to add, oftentimes these stories are people, mostly girls or women, who are on the small size. I even saw a comment the other day pointing out how these people tend to be targeted more. I'm 5'9 and 160 pounds, and thought maybe this was partly why I've been so lucky enough to avoid these types of encounters. I find it pretty interesting that this experience occurred when I had my hands full with two little, little kids. Seems like these type of people target those who are more vulnerable. This past September, I had taken a road trip to Myrtle Beach with my family. It was myself, my mother, my sister, her husband, and their two kids. We had used my car and both my sister and husband's car to transport everything and all of us. We had rented a beach house for a little over a week, had a pretty great time. I was in the middle of a difficult point in my life and struggling with employment and being between jobs, and having just started two new jobs fresh. I was a little low on funds and worried about making my car payments and the like, so I opted to head home two days early with my car so I could try and get more hours at work. My family expressed being nervous as I planned to leave after dinner and drive through the night to get home. I consoled them that I'd be okay to be up all night and I'd head straight home and only stop for gas and food as needed. I'm an excellent driver, a tad impatient so I tend to go until I absolutely had to stop and take a break. However, this would be a 12 hour trip and I knew I would need breaks, so I made a point to stop at every rest stop at least to get out and stretch so I stayed awake and didn't get too sore. Going through West Virginia, I'm sure you guys know how secluded their rest stops and visitor centers and the like are, especially when you're heading north from the south going through the mountains. I stopped at a visitor center because they advertised having a fast food joint and I had to pee like a racehorse. This was sometime very late at night, maybe 1am to 3am sometime. Side note, that sends shivers down my spine after what happens. I like to drive barefoot. So I pulled in, noticed the buildings with fast food were closed, so I drove around the lot and parked under a street light in front of the visitor center so I could use the restroom. Leaning out of my car door, I took my time putting my shoes on to walk inside, having looked around and not seen anyone out of the ordinary. I checked my phone and grabbed my wallet before standing up to walk in, making sure my car horn beeped to signal my doors were locked. Walking towards the center, I saw a man in a white hoodie standing at the edge of the sidewalk leading into the center. I didn't think much of it, until I passed him and got an off vibe. I glanced over my shoulder and he was watching me walk in. For some reason, I glanced to my left as I turned back to face forward and noted another man sitting at the benches that were on the other side of tall, thin bushes. Instantly, I thought, nope, 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 nope. I went in and peed, and before I walked out of the bathroom, I called my roommate 
as dumb as it was because he was a good four to six hours away. I just felt safer. I gave him a quick rundown of my situation and made him stay on the phone with me. I started to walk out and I couldn't see the man at the front of the sidewalk anymore. I glanced at my now right and saw both men standing next to a bench. Facing forward, I saw a couple walking in to presumably use the restroom as well. I had an impulse to ask them to walk with me, but my paranoia kicked in because I knew something was wrong somewhere in my situation and I didn't ask, thinking they might know the men. Walking briskly to my car, I explained to my roommate that the men were by the benches. Daring the smallest of peaks over my shoulder again, I saw the man in the white hoodie walking towards me and I told my roommate. Walking a few more paces forward, I looked back again and saw his pace had quickened. At this point, I told my roommate he's following me to my car and I booked it. I thankfully had a key fob, got my key out and ready and unlocked my car and practically threw myself in. Not daring a glance back, I threw my car in reverse and gunned it backwards before going back into drive and sped off and didn't even stop to put my seatbelt on until I was at the exit to leave the parking lot. I didn't look back once. Stopped at the next toll road and filed a report and the workers called for state troopers to head over and check things out. I didn't stop shaking for hours and I refused to get out of my car until I was home. I horrified myself at the thought of if those guys had paid attention and made their move more quickly, they could have incapacitated me at my car while I was facing the ground and putting my shoes on and I could have had absolutely no defense. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, rletsreadofficial, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. If you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt.com. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.